I'd like to do a series of talks on the cross of Calvary. So this series is entitled Cross Talks. The question I'd like to raise is what happens in a crossroads crash? What happens at a crossroads crash? For crossroads is a very important intersection, is it not? You have two horizontal roads running across two vertical roads, in a sense, if you were to put them straight up. And as these flows of traffic intersect at that crossroads, many times you can have a violent collision taking place because drivers do not heed the instruction of who has the right of way. So you have two directions of traffic colliding. There is a distinct sense in which two worlds collide both horizontally and vertically when we think of the cross of Calvary. Because at that crossroads, heaven and earth collided vertically and horizontally, the old order collided with the new order. And what a collision that was. So Calvary becomes a watershed, a crossroads collision of note that divides history in a very real sense. When we think of a crossroads, we also think of the resurrection. The resurrection followed Calvary. It was what came after the cross. And I'd like to discuss for a moment the resurrection in relation to four areas of life that are very significant. The first area is our mortality. The resurrection speaks to our mortality. Not only to our mortality, but it also speaks to sterility in life. Not only mortality and sterility, but it also speaks to captivity. And finally, it speaks to our spirituality. So let's look at the first one. The resurrection addresses our mortality. It addresses the issue of how life springs out of death. Life out of death. It is very significant uh, to be aware that in the Old Testament, there were a number of times when resurrection was experienced. For example, Elijah, the prophet, raises a dead boy. He brings a dead boy to life. Elisha brings to life the son of a Shunammite woman. So the idea of resurrection from the dead, a resurrection from the dead, is not foreign to the old order, to the Old Testament. The book of Isaiah speaks of it, and the book of Daniel addresses the issue. But resurrection has something to say, not only to our mortality, but also to the old issue of sterility, because in Romans 4, Abram and Sarah are well on in their years, and... Uh, there is laughter at, in both of their lives because they cannot picture two old people enjoying each other intimately and a child being born out of that union. But Romans 4 speaks of birth that arises out of barrenness because Abram believed God and, uh, of course, a child is born in their old age. So resurrection brings about fertility out of sterility as it brings forth life out of death. But thirdly, we notice that resurrection has something to say to captivity. The captivity of the people of God in the Old Testament was 
very real. They went into a 70-year exile because they would not let the land lie rest, the Old Testament says, because they did not honor the fact that the land needed to rest not only every seventh year, but also every year of Jubilee. They did not honor those ecological principles that God had put in place. They go into seven years of captivity. And um, the Old Testament describes this captivity as uh, a resuscitation of the nation. They will come out of their graves, the graves of their captivity to which they were exiled. Ezekiel 37 speaks of this resuscitation of the nation. She'll be brought back from the graves of exile. And so does Isaiah chapter 11, uh, verse number 11. Israel will come back a second time out of a diaspora, out of a captivity. And so this idea of life out of death is not unknown in the Old Order or in the Old Testament. Because when we look at the books of the Old Testament, in the Torah, for example, Israel must learn in order to live. Throughout the first five books of the Bible, she needs to learn in order to live. And then when we look at the former prophets, we see that Israel must bow in order to bloom as a nation unless she bows to the kings whom God had placed over to administer his economy. Uh, they would not experience the blessing of God because the king was God's emissary, God's ambassador, God's representative, if you will, uh, over the nation. So they needed to bow in order to bloom. And then in the latter prophets, we see that the message becomes even more startling. Because now Israel must die in order to rise. And unless she experienced this dying, this death of captivity that will come upon her, uh, she would not be able to sustain her life. That's why that passage in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, is so significant. The plans I have for you, the devices, the counsel I have for you, is meant for good and not for harm. And what's the counsel that I have for you? Get with God's program while in exile. Live in the culture. Let your kids marry. Build homes. Plant gardens. And pray for the shalom of the city. Pray for the well-being and the welfare and the peace of the city. Also the message in the latter prophets have to do with the fact that Israel's enemies must die never to rise. So you have this death resurrection idea spoken of in the Old Testament. So that by the time you come to the New Testament... Resurrection carries great significance because it will be embodied and portrayed in the person of Jesus Christ. You also see that from the Old Testament books, the writings. The writings were meant to guide Israel's life between the times. The time between the times when, when she was kicked off the land, when she lived in exile. She needed to understand how to conduct her life. And that's what the book of the writings address and speak to. Well, the Apostle Paul is a very important figure in the New Testament because, you see, Paul was a Pharisee. And in the book of Acts chapter 23, he comes up before the council with Ananias, the high priest. And he describes himself as one who is a follower of the way in relation to resurrection. Because you see, he knew that the Sadducees and the Pharisees were two opposing groups. And Paul was a Pharisee all his life, incidentally, because of his belief in resurrection, because 
Pharisees adopted a belief concerning resurrection. And so he knew that as he championed the way in relation to resurrection, he would be on very fertile ground as he addressed the opposers uh, to the message of the cross. But you see, this could only happen because Paul had a crossroads encounter. Now we know that uh, from a very interesting book, uh, a very interesting chapter in the book of Acts. Paul's horizontal world collides. And Paul's vertical worlds collide. And so in Acts chapter 9, we see an account of Paul's conversion. Paul is en route somewhere. He's en route from Jerusalem to Damascus because he's holding missives or letters. Uh, Acts chapter 9 verse number 1 says, Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So Paul was a Pharisee of the old order. He was a believer in resurrection, but he pursued this route of resurrection, not in the power of the cross, but in the power of the old order, what I would call after the order of Phineas. Now, Phineas is a very interesting character because he is mentioned in Numbers chapter 25. And in Numbers chapter 25, because of Phineas's zeal for God, he performs quite a violent act because two people, Phineas rises up because of his zeal for God and of course kills both parties. So he does it in the energy of the flesh. That's Paul's zeal. Philippians chapter 3, rather, talks about Paul's zeal. He says, not only am I an eighth day man, not only was I circumcised on the eighth day, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. You see, as a follower of the old order of resurrection, he went after those who were perpetrating this idea of resurrection in the name of Jesus. But you see, as one of the old order, his world collided, collides with the world of the new order. Because you see, anything that is flesh-driven is going to crash. Anything motivated by self-effort will crash. We think of so many things in life that are motivated by the flesh, that are things that are driven by the flesh. Status in life. Image is everything. Not only that, but we find that in Paul's encounter with the risen Lord on the road to Damascus, God encounters him en route somewhere, the way God encounters us en route. And his horizontal worlds collides because he's coming from Jerusalem, he's going to Damascus. And it's on that road that heaven collides with us in his life. The God of heaven through the person of Jesus Christ, appears to Paul and smites him to the ground, smites him to earth, smites him to his knees. Of course, he's blinded in that encounter, but he engages with the risen Lord on the road to Damascus because his worlds collide. Because you see, our worlds collide at Calvary. The world of the old order collides with the world of the new order, initiated by Jesus Christ. 
heaven collides with earth at, the, at Calvary because the justice of God engages with the sinfulness of man. Heavenly justice collides with earthly sin and sin propagated by man. Philippians 2 verse 5 to 11 gives us that picture of uh, what a cross-driven experience is all about. It's that master story, the gospel story in chapter 2 verse number 5 to verse 11. And in that account, it talks about how Jesus steps out of eternity into time and how that eternity is in, interrupted at Calvary for something like 400 minutes where God finally turns his back on his son and Jesus cries, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So Paul is caught in this crossroads collision that starts at the cross, that started at the cross. But you see, it didn't end there. It went all the way to the grave. It went all the way to the empty tomb and all the way to the right hand of the Father. So you have crucifixion, you have resurrection, and you have ascension. Because you see, God desires for believers to live an ascended life. A life victorious over sin. A life victorious over that which binds us. Paul is caught in a crossroads crash and it reminds us of that hymn. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. So Paul not only understood resurrection as life giving but he also understood crucifixion as dying as a death which leads us to our fourth point that resurrection not only speaks to mortality it not only speaks to fertility it not only speaks to captivity but it also speaks to spirituality because you see, spiritual growth is predicated on a cruciform understanding of the work of God through the person of Jesus Christ. Remember, we don't speak about the crucified God. We speak of the cruciform God because he's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died on a cross and rose again and ascended to the right hand of the Father. So our spirituality has to do with our being slaves to sin and how that death and dying is the antidote for slavery to sin because you see the spirit has a killing activity in the life of a believer because the spirit applies the work of the cross to the life of the Christian so death is not only a destination death is also a journey right we not only die to get into god's heaven literally dying that could be used figuratively as well dying to get into god's heaven but you see it's also understanding that life springs out of death resurrection is predicated on crucifixion so you cannot have the cross without having resurrection as well. So the cross is shorthand, Paul's shorthand way of saying Jesus died and rose again and he's ascended to the right hand of the Father. So death and dying and life and living is the antidote. Or three things the flesh the world and satan the cross is the answer jesus is the answer now of course what is the question the question is how 
is Jesus the answer? Has the cross the answer to dealing with the flesh, the world, and Satan? And in each of those three areas, the answer or the solution is the same. It's Calvary. But we need to understand how Calvary operates to liberate us from sin and allow us to live for God. Let's close off here with an illustration that I think most of us will understand. In our own country, we've had a massive paradigm shift politically. This country moved from apartheid to a democracy. And as this paradigm shifted from apartheid to democracy, many were crushed in his wake. Those who were unwilling got crushed when that paradigm shifted because they refused to accept what was happening. But those who were the paradigm pioneers moved with the process to move into a new era. And we so well remember how that in that short time when the Cadessa talks took place, how uh, that things bottlenecked and we almost had uh, a freeze on the political talks and everyone thought that South Africa would be plunged into a conflagration of note, a bloody revolution. Uh, but things moved rather well for us because the old order encountered the new order. What is the new order, the new paradigm? A post-apartheid society which was inclusive and multicultural and representative. It collided with the old order which was white, minority rule, monocultural and oppressive. And so the vertical axis had to do with justice colliding with oppression. Justice colliding with exploitation and Codessa made a way dialogically for that to take place, that shift. Well, you see, at the cross, that's what happened. There were two vertical worlds that collided. The justice of God with the love of God collided with the sinfulness of man. The old order collided with a new order at Calvary. And what a crash that was. What a collision that was. So there are three questions that I'd like to leave with you to think about that comes out of an understanding of this crossroads collision. Question one. How is Paul's old order, resurrection thinking, reconfigured reoriented by his Damascus experience. How was Paul's old order resurrection thinking reconfigured by his Damascus experience? Number two, what kind of person was Paul that made him a game changer? What kind of person was Paul that made him a game changer. And then question number three. What continuities or discontinuities exist at a vertical and horizontal level uh, as Paul becomes a proponent of the cross work of Christ? What continuities exist and what continuities come into play with Paul's revised or reconfigured thinking as a result of encountering the cross work of Christ. So those are three biblical questions, but I also want to give you three questions, Socratic discussion kind of questions that give rise to other questions as we think about what is happening in our own culture and what ought to happen in our own culture. And here's the first one. Number one, how in can a precipitating event change old order ways of thinking in new and fresh ways of seeing? 
In what ways can a precipitating event change old ways of thinking in new and fresh ways of seeing? The rise of COVID is smashing our world. And we have, are having to rethink how should we then live? How do we educate? How do we school? How do we live in light of these unexpected divine interruptions in our lives? Second question. What kind of people make for good game changers? What kind of people make for good game changing, game changers as people? And then number three, what continuities and discontinuities exist on a linear and perpendicular plane as old order thinkers encounter game changing events? Because surely we live in times of great upheaval. And we can't think straight. COVID has done that. Some of the rioting in the country, state capture, all these issues are doing that to us and challenging our thinking and challenging our comfort zones. May God bless you as you grapple with the significance of the crossroads crash that took place at Calvary in relation to how should we then live. Amen.